Okay, uh, just a few cases uh, this weekend. These first couple, um, uh, Art Stillman uh, shared with me, so I appreciate these cases. Um, th this case is a uh, case of a patient who um, was being um, anticoagulated for atrial fibrillation. You can see that the left atrium is um, enlarged, the atrial appendage is enlarged. And coming down, you can see, obviously, there's a dramatic um, abnormality uh, that is arising from the aortic valve, and this was actually discovered on a um, echo uh, that the patient had just an incidental uh, finding on this echo that the patient was having. And you can see that the uh, um, one of the aortic valve leaflets closest to the non coronary sinus is um, really thickened here, and you can follow this up. And um, the question here was, what was this? Um, was this going to be a um, a um, fibroblastoma. Um, I've never seen one so so large and linear like this. Was this going to be a thrombus? Um, was this going to be a vegetation? Uh, she wasn't symptomatic and had no sepsis, no other symptoms, no um, embolic symptoms, no stroke or any other embolic symptoms. Let me show you the um, motion on this. Let me play the. You can actually see that this dramatic abnormality is prolapsing um, back and forth across the aortic valve here into the ascending aorta. And I have another uh, reformat here that I can show a um, movie. Uh, let's see, the movie is playing fairly, fairly quickly here, but you can see that it's uh, prolapsing dramatically across the aortic valve. And let me show you what this turned out to be. The patient was uh, taken uh, for aortic um, valve replacement, and I'll show you the path on this. So here's the, the specimen, and um, th these are the aortic valve leaflets, and then here's this um, mass that was adherent to the non-coronary leaflet here. And this just turned out to be a path to be thrombus. So just a huge linear thrombus. It's kind of a mystery how this formed in the setting of chronic um, anticoagulation, but this was a large uh, dramatic thrombus, um, one of the more dramatic cases I've seen, so just quite a uh, large thrombus there. So has anyone ever, ever seen a, you know, kind of a larger thrombus in this, uh, adherent to one of the valve leaflets? No, and is, is it one that she had had prior echoes and nothing was there and this was new, right. or is it? Yeah. It was, it was new, and I'm not sure exactly when the, the interval was of the last normal one, but um, this was a new abnormality, so um, just uh, was um, kind of, you know, shocked by that, but just such a dramatic appearance there. <laughs> so, anyway, there's that case. Brent, uh, Brent the only yep. thing I noticed is on that cine loop right there, there's a fleck of calcium right at the, uh, looks like at the, one of the valve the commissures or something like right on the intima. I wonder if that was a like a plaque might have been a possible nidus. Yeah, that's a there might you know, and thinking about this, there must have been some nidus. Yeah, you know, on the, the the axial cine loop, there's a little fleck of calcium at about six o'clock. Yeah, let me go back to to look at this. I'll just scroll through this. Let's see if we can see that. Yeah. Um, so there was one, one of the one of the series you showed sort of I'm right, sure. where the one of the, the yeah about six o'clock position on the valve yeah yeah I think there was probably a speck of, of so you would wonder you know yeah is that a lead point was something there a, a nidus for the formation must have been so yeah so I'm just looking very strange the nidus, though so very strange um, here's here's an even uh, even more dramatic case. <laughs> Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the scout. I had the scout for this. I, I eliminated the scout view here. But um, this is a patient who, um, who had um, um, sarcoid and had had a lung transplant um, years prior to this. Uh, this is a patient in, I believe, the uh, uh, 40s or early 50s. Um, who had a lung transplant. You can see that, um, you know, there's some stenosis here, bronchial stenosis, had um, some stents uh, that had to be placed. So the lung transplant was, um, I believe, in uh, 2010 or 2011. Um, but you can see uh, this dramatic um, skin findings, and you can see, look at all these, um, you know, plaque-like areas uh, along the skin, just really, really 
really exuberant um, areas of um, plaque, like, you know, uh, soft tissue along the skin. Um, some of these are kind of look fungating and, and whatnot. Um, so uh, th this patient, it turns out, it had a long history with um, dermatology as well. And uh, these were actually um, biopsied and, and diagnosed as keloids. Um, so um, don't have any imaging from, and, and this CT I'm showing you is from, uh, you know, just this month. Uh, I don't have any imaging from 2010 when they had some of the um, oldest dermatology notes written, but I can tell you that drawn on that um, examination, that physical examination, were not nearly as many areas of keloid as there are now. So you would wonder if, um, you know, a lot of the uh, the trauma from the surgery um, actually exacerbated a lot of these. I mean, they're kind of in locations that you, you know, truncal locations that you wonder if the surgery exacerbated these. Uh, so um, just uh, really dramatic uh, keloid formation. I mean, you wonder, you wonder just in looking at this, at first of this is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma case or something, but um, just a uh, case of really dramatic keloid formation. So, so Brent, a couple of things. First, if you, I bet if you put it on a coronal, the, the stuff in the anterior chest wall looks like a perfect distribution for a clamshell thoracotomy. Yep. Look at that. Yeah. Yep. Right. And then the other interesting finding, I, I, um, if you look back on the lung windows um, and whether or not it's related at all, I doubt it, but this patient has more of a restrictive allograph appearance with some, looks like early pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis going on up top. Right. Yeah. Yep. You're exactly right. Yeah. An upper lobe fibrosis, probably um, RAS, and um, it is more of a restrictive appearance than than a uh, obstructive um, bronchiolitis obliterans appearance of rejection. So yeah, that's kind of a good case of two different things. That's so, cool. Wow. Um, and then uh, maybe one or so. Um, th this is a uh, uh, case of a um, patient in her uh, early uh, 40s, I believe. And uh, we have this appearance on the lung windows and can see that in the upper lobes, there is uh, some peripheral uh, abnormality that is more anterior predominant. And then as you scroll down here to the lung bases, you have pretty well-defined um, areas of um, both fibrosis and then also regional areas of, um, you know, what we've kind of been calling uh, a lung destruction type pattern. Um, and you notice that you have very straight edges here, straight margins. Um, and it doesn't look uh, like classic honeycombing. Um, the edges are very straight. And uh, this is a patient with a connective tissue disease. This is a patient with lupus. And I just think it's a very nice example of a variant, um, sort of a variant UIP or a not UIP pattern. Um, you know, we're finding more and more of these cases and um, trying to uh, study them. And uh, Jonathan Chong has, you know, recently published a couple of articles on the signs involved here, the straight edge sign yeah. that you get more commonly in connective tissue related lung disease than in IPF and the anterior upper lobe sign where you get fibrosis in the anterior upper lobes um, commonly. And sort of the four corner sign here where you get um, very well defined areas of fibrosis that are um, anterior and posterior uh, right here. So I saw this as a nice case of lupus related lung uh, fibrosis with all the classic signs that you would see in a connective tissue related yeah. lung disease. So Brent, this is interesting. The esophagus is quite abnormal. Can you make a sagittal reformat here? Yep. And the, the esophagus yeah. is abnormal. And um, a lot of these patients have, you know, sort of some sort of overlap, um, you know, and I don't know if this patient also had uh, overlap with, with uh, scleroderma. Um, if you put on the lung windows, though, and then rotate it backwards 90 degrees and then rotate it anteriorly 90 degrees, makes you wonder if aspiration plays a role in this. Because if you ro rotate the patient onto their back as if they're supine, yeah, grab the rotation tool. Uh, rotate? Yeah. Oh, like this. You tilt them on their back, and you see most of the dependent lung is back there. Now, if you flip them on their belly, you'll see that most of the dependent lung is the anterior upper lobe. And that, that may actually be one of the reasons that... Um, you uh, get that. Yeah, uh, it makes you wonder because you see a lot of aspiration in these connective tissue diseases. 
Yeah, I mean, you're probably onto something because there has to be some reason why. I mean, we're finding this very common, like very, very common to yeah. have, you know, um, Jonathan's anterior upper lip sign, mm -hmm. um, you know, in these in these patients, and um, you know, you can see this this leading edge of the abnormality. It's very straight in these these patients, and the um, you know what what some people may call um, you know honeycombing. It's actually very heterogeneous here, and so. Um, that's that's another sign that you're not dealing with just a classic UIP as you know as Jonathan has recently well you know well described so um, you know just a very interesting uh, in his paper that just came out in AJR so I just thought this was a good demonstration of all those all those findings. Uh, Brent, I think the the point one point should be here that <clears throat> lupus by itself does not usually cause interstitial lung disease. You usually don't see basal fibrosis with lupus. So, you know, that and the esophageal abnormality here really point to this person probably having some sort of overlap. Right, right. And some of our patients do, but we have, we have a large, uh, you know, number of lupus patients. And I would say I have about, you know, I don't know, 80 cases now that of, of lupus patients and with fibrosis. And um, many of them, you know, a few, you know, we're, we're trying to select out the ones that have overlap and even the ones that don't, um, you know, can have this this pattern. So it's it's very um, interesting because um, I, I I don't think in the end that all of these are going to be attributable to just um, an overlap, um, you know, syndrome. Um, but but we'll see once you know, kind of processing things. So <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Brett. All right. That's it. <laughs> all right. Who would like to show next? I have a few I can show or I can wait, doesn't matter to me. All right, you're up. Okay, you guys see my Osirix? We do. All right, I'm gonna start with this one. My, my fellow brought this one to my attention this morning. This is kind of an interesting case. And I'll show you this lady's CT from last month, first of all. So she has metastatic small cell lung cancer and she has some pleural and internal mammary disease right here you can see internal mammary node when she had originally presented she had obstruction of her right sided airways and so they placed this endobronchial stent and it was placed sometime last month or or before and you can see it's in the right main stem bronchus just distal to the carina so that's her stent. She went home and then she came back in on the 23rd. And I will show you this radiograph. And she came into the emergency room and she had had what she reported as like sudden onset of dyspnea and cough right after she had been eating. And this wasn't noted at the time, whoever, whenever this was seen in the emergency department. But if you really zoom in and see, you can see her stent is here. It looks like the carina is there. And the stent perhaps not in the same place as it was. And that was, a, you can see the timeline. This was a 538. They actually sent her home, I guess. And then she came back a couple hours later because she was feeling even worse. So they decided to do a PE study. And sure enough, you can see that her stent has now migrated cephalad into her trachea. And as a result, it's partly, you know, it's compromising her left-sided airway too. So she's exhaling during this study, and maybe you can argue that she has a little bit of overinflation of her left lung relative to her right. I think you can probably say, say that. Granted, she has a lot of other issues on the right side. But this was noted on the CT at this time. And what's interesting, though, is by the time somebody had talked to the emergency physician, they had gone in and talked to the patient. And in the emergency department, the patient had coughed this up. So she coughed up her stent, and then almost immediately her symptoms went away. So, and there's a there's a picture of her stent. So it's kind of interesting. So I don't know. I, yeah. So it's kind of a kind of a cool case, but in uh, a, a good ending at least for that. Not with her metastatic disease, but I guess it always goes to show you that you just have to be careful like looking at these and make sure that you assess where they where they are and here's her radiograph the next day and sure enough there is no stent there anymore so <clears throat> presumably presumably she under when she underwent treatment 
I don't know if it, it shrunk the tumor enough that her airways opened up and that's what caused it, you know, in part to dislodge. But I thought that was a cool one. Has anybody ever seen uh, somebody cough up an airway stent before? Not seen them cough them up, but I have seen them migrate like this and end up obstructing at the level of the carina, which is pretty bad. Denser, yes, yeah. have a lot of complications. They they usually, you know, are trouble free. Right. And like you can see here, uh, yeah, I mean, this is almost entirely sealing off and jailing that left main stem bronchus here. So, all right. This is a case that I saw a couple weeks ago. And this is a lady who's, as you can see, 59 years old. And her history was that she woke up suddenly one night with a few episodes of diarrhea. And this was a couple days prior to presentation. Previously healthy, no history other than that. So she had about three days of non-bloody diarrhea. She originally treated, attributed it to some bad Indian food that she had eaten. Her husband didn't get sick though at the same time. So she came in and she got a full chest and pelvis. I'm not exactly sure. I think she had a little bit of dyspnea when she came in and had a pleural effusion on a radiograph. And I had saved this as I've, I've got to put together a pericardial talk and I saved it as just a great example of pericardial anatomy because you can see there's this large pericardial effusion and you see this nice smooth circumferential pericardial thickening and enhancement and you can see it you know totally encasing the heart here it's a nice example of the oblique sinus you can see some of the transverse sinus here that's also you know somewhat outlined here and you know i didn't think much else of it she other than a little bit of dyspnea she didn't really have any pain but given the history of diarrhea we were thinking probably this was going to be some sort of viral pericarditis and she had a little bit of ascites as well well given the size of this they put a drain in it and they actually tapped her acidic fluid as well and this actually came back surprisingly as metastatic lung adenocarcinoma when they did all of the stains i have never seen a case of metastatic or a malignant pericardial effusion give you such smooth or apparently smooth thickening. And what's more, she doesn't really have a primary tumor. And this right pleural effusion is, is there. I mean, I, I think that she's just got a little bit of biapical scar. You know, the, the one thing I never was able to reconcile though is she did have her right middle lobe bronchus here, you can see narrows considerably. And she does have a little bit of volume loss but I don't know if there was a, if there is or was a tumor there. I have no idea. But I think this is probably just a little bit of edematous fluid and septal thickening here with the effusion. I don't know. But never really found a primary tumor. But this kind of surprised me when they when they tapped this. Wow. So, Travis, of course, the, the septal lines and the peribronchial cuffs may be telling us that she's got lymphangitic tumor spread, of course, too. Yeah, I mean, she could. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't know. I guess the one question would just be that because she had a, you know, they thought on echo she may have had a little bit of early tamponade, and you can see her little deformity of the free wall of her RV and right atrium. I thought maybe it, it could be, you know, some sort of, you know, hydrostatic effect. I don't know, but you're right. It, it very well may be, but certainly that's not what we were thinking at this at the time. Was there any compression of pulmonary veins um, draining back into the left atrium? Yeah, that's a good question too. No. No, it looks no. It's so true. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree, Howard. I mean, certainly now that we know there's cancer, we it could be, but it was just such a weird case. But yeah, you could see her her yeah, her right middle lobe bronchus just, you know, disappears and then pops back open right there. So I have no idea. They haven't bronched her yet, and she does have some small nodes on that side. So undoubtedly these are Probably going to be, you know, metas or malignant nodes as well. So, this this one, uh, but yeah, I've never seen a malignant effusion give you this smooth pleural or pericardial thickening like that. And what's interesting too about her ascites is that she has no real discrete nodularity of her peritoneal cavity, but this was also positive for adenocarcinoma as well when they did a sample of her acidic fluid. So, really unfortunate case. And yeah. she's undergoing genetic testing now to figure out what she will be able to 
to be treated with. Now this one, Howard, this let's let me make sure I've got the right one here. This one's for you. And this is a, a very remarkable case. And this is the only CT we have is an abdomen and pelvis CT, but this is again why I always look at everything because you never know when you're gonna find interesting things. So this is a young woman, as you see, she's 38, and her story started a couple months prior where she developed intermittent fevers. She was traveling in Costa Rica and else other places. And she had had, a, she, at an outside hospital, she had had a positive blood culture for an enterococcus species and then was put on some antibiotics and didn't get better, had another positive blood culture, and they decided to admit her around the time of this radiograph. And this radiograph is, you know, not too bad. But then we look here, and this is five days later, and you can see now that she is in florid edema. And you can see just beautiful septal thickening and curly lines, peripherally, fissural thickening, cuffing, I think a little bit of distension of her, her azagus, which could be just because she's partly, in part because she's portable. You can also see too that it looks like her left atrium is, is enlarged. Now, I don't know why they didn't do a chest CT, but I, I saw one of these follow-up radiographs and I went back and looked at the abdomen and pelvis CT and check out the degree of septal lakes that we have at the bases. And this is one of the prettiest one examples I've seen, Howard, of these, of our, of our little septal lakes. They look like sausage links. Yeah. And just, yeah. And we know, of course, this is edema because it was acute. It wasn't there five days ago. And what's interesting too, and what was not, you know, what was overlooked on this study is that, of course, whenever you have new onset edema, always go looking for a cause. And, you know, knowing that she had bacteremia, you can actually see right here, there's motion. But um, yeah, this looked at that and said, oh, maybe there's a vegetation on here. And it turns out, yes, she did have enterococcal endocarditis and it totally destroyed her anterior mitral leaflet. And so one of my colleagues was arguing that it's subtle and you can't know that there's actually vegetation there. And I would argue that if you don't look for it, you're never gonna see it. And of course it was, you know, at this point she was bacteremic and they, they kind of knew this was there anyway, but she then subsequently underwent a mitral valve replacement and her edema improved. But yeah, does I think- it, more, Does she have more lakes on the right than the left? No. I don't think so. Oh, no, look. Maybe. You want it to be a little asymmetric edema from the mitral insufficiency? See? Yeah, she might have uh, maybe a few. I mean, but she, yeah, I just, when I saw this, I wasn't even looking at the lung windows first. I was just looking at the heart to look, you know, to look for this. And then all of a sudden, when I switched to lung windows, I was like, wow, this is the best case of lakes I've seen. No, that so, yeah, maybe mitral valve is great. That's a great observation. So maybe it yeah. is a little bit of, uh, maybe it is a little bit more asymmetric, and the effusions are a little asymmetric. But it's just such a nice radiograph too, and maybe yeah, uh, maybe a little bit more right than left. Wow, that's so very interesting. Yes, and I you. think, and I, I think also that, and I actually didn't realize this until I was just showing this to you guys that I think the left atrium looks larger here than it did even five days before that. Now, of course, again, it might be just technique too, but obviously her mitral insufficiency and destruction of the valve progressed over a short period of time. Yes. So. Okay. All right. Travis? Yeah. It's, a good, it's also a good example of how the uh, azagus can be used as a marker for uh, intravascular volume, because look at that uh, yeah. comparison between that and the prior. Yeah, I wonder if, if any of this could, you know, some of that could be just that she's supine too, but you're right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then this last one. Oh, it's because I'm in the wrong list. That's my issue. Here we go. Now, this is one where, again, my, I haven't seen one of these on, a, on an ICU radiograph in a while. This is a lady who, as you can see, this was right after her sternotomy. She's got a transvenous, I think a transvenous pacemaker at this point through a subclavian approach. She underwent an emergent median sternotomy. She had 100% occlusion of at least, I think it was of her distal RCA or PDA, I can't remember. 
has a little bit of atelectasis there. And, you know, she was still in the hospital a few weeks later. And I think it was this radiograph that I saw. And at this point, she has a large bore dialysis catheter in. She was had some acute renal insufficiency. And of course, right here, as I always preach, that the lungs are the last thing I look at in ICU radiographs. And now you can see that this sternal wire looks like it's displaced. And this one actually, you know, there was a little bit of discussion. I was nervous about it, obviously, because it's way out of line here. There was some discussion, though, others saying, oh, no, that's not, you know, you would expect them all to be zigzagging back and forth. But I've seen this before where one will go one way and one goes the other. And then I'll show you just to compare to her prior CT. I can put up a coronal here. And you'll see that, you know, sure enough that. Sure enough, that wire, you know, always started a little bit further off to the right side, but, you know, there's no way to explain, there's not really any rotation here. There's no way to explain it migrating other than dehiscence. And so here's the follow-up CT, and you will see that sure enough, it's kind of an interesting CT too, because there's other findings as well. But you'll see that this is a dehiscence where one wire has gone one, gone one way and all the other wires have gone the other way. So I think it's a good example. And just to remember, you know, you don't have to see zigzags, that it can just be one that pulls one way and tears through the bone and then all the others go the other way as in this case. So this was a confirmed, yeah, this was a confirmed dehiscence. And, you know, it was probably there on this on, for a day or two, but even I didn't have all the other intermittent radiographs, but, you know, it was, you know, it was a relatively new finding at this point. And then I'll show you on her CT. What was interesting is that a lot of this was just, you know, they, they didn't actually culture anything. Most of this was just hematoma. And they went in and evacuated the hematoma. And some of it was even inferiorly. And it was kind of around where they did this anastomosis. And I was worried that there was a little leak from where they had anastomosed the vein graft. They didn't find anything when they went to surgery. But you can see a, just a nice example of a dehiscence with a, you know, to some degree, one could argue maybe a little bit of a subtle radiograph, but once you, you know, if you're looking for it, not too subtle at all. And no infection, so, you said? No, I mean, I, th I think there has to be something there. They didn't grow anything, but she, um, she had had a sternal wound infection a few days before, or, you know, she wasn't draining at this point, but I don't know, we'll see. She's still in the hospital. I don't know. I struggle with sterility of these types of things because it certainly, you know, would explain why the sternum splits. Right. But okay, those are mine for now. Thank you, David or Howard. I have a couple. People see an abnormal chest rentgenogram. Okay. Yeah. So this young woman was short of breath and um, came to the hospital and had uh, this radiograph and followed by a CT scan, which confirms a very large effusion in the left hemithorax and some abnormalities in the upper abdomen as well. Some sort of low attenuation stuff here near the spine between the aorta and the kidney here. So this sort of bubbly stuff back here. Uh, let's go back to this and look at a uh, lung window here. And you know, there are a few little holes in the lung, discrete little holes. I think she was around 30 at this time. She had a little look like um, long after her surgery, she's, Oh, sorry, long after her, the resolution of that pleural effusion, she does have some solid pleural thickening that blunts the costophrenic angle. And then uh, here's a CT scan. This is uh, uh, more than a decade after her original presentation, and she has all of these thin-walled cysts through her lungs, very thin walls, not really un un unappreciable walls in many locations here, nothing in the cysts, no distortion, and they seem to go through the lungs, well represented in the bases, not just confined to the upper parts of the lung. And this is documented lymphangiolyomatosis, as you 
probably suspected, presenting with chylothorax. And um, the, I, what I really liked about this case was the dilated lymphatics in the upper abdomen uh, that were visible then on the lymphangiogram as those um, it, it, visible on the CT as those low attenuation lesions. Didn't have any renal tumors. She's not very short of breath. She's asymptomatic, and so there was no, she was not considered to be a transplant candidate. So she's tolerated her lymphangiomyomatosis pretty well. Okay. Um, now here's a man who um, has this abnormal chest radiograph, and this is a current study, but he's looked this way for the last 10 years. He had a history of pneumothorax and had pleurodesis on both sides. So he's left with this pleural thickening. He's also obese. His BMI is around 35 or 36. And so some of his low lung volume is not just the pleural thing, but his abdominal um, lipomatosis. And so this is what his current radiograph looks like, but this is the way he's looked for more than 10 years. Um, let me show you CT on this man. Um, you'll see that he does indeed have abdominal obesity. He's got um, pleural thickening that tethers his diaphragm. And let me see if I can find a good lung window for you. Um, here is, I think we're still in MIPS land here. Here we go. And this fellow also has cystic lung disease that's concentrated at the bases, not as many lesions as the young woman had. They taper off to the upper lungs. Some of them are elliptical. Some of them are along the edges of the lobes like this. Some of them are along veins. And this is, as you might have suspected by now, uh, Berthog dubé syndrome. So this presented with pneumothorax um, on both sides. He got pleurodesis before he came. And then it turns out <clears throat> that he has a family history that's positive for malignancies and pneumothorax in his in his father. So he said that everybody dies of cancer in his family. He didn't have renal tumors on his uh, abdominal CT. He had a few cysts in his kidneys, but no visible renal tumors. And so he's just being monitored for any tumor development from his uh, bird hog to bay. And he had nice skin lesions. So I'm trying to get a copy of the uh, skin lesions on his face and his neck that were biopsied and were confirmed to be fibrofolliculomas. So two cases of um, cystic lung disease, lamb and bird hog to bay. Very nice. Thank okay, you. those are the two cases I wanted to show. You know, it's interesting, the sort of the variability of lamb. Um, you know, I've seen it in older women who it was an incidental finding. We just had a case of a young woman who doesn't have a, has a very low perfusion of cysts, but presented with spontaneous pneumothorax and they did a pleurodesis. So they decided to take a little pinch of one of the lungs while they were in there. And it's a confirmed lamb case. She's asymptomatic and is almost approaching 40. And then you've got women who have severe obstruction, shortness of breath at that same age. Yeah. All right. Everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to withhold some history for the moment, but show you two images of the chest. So the time between these two is, well, this is 12, 16, 15, and then 11, 30. So a new finding here, actually, let me bring up the MRI that was done of the heart to give you the timing of things. So the one that corresponds to the right-hand image I'm going to put over here, and this one is before. So the time here, let me remind myself, is eight days. And when we go down here, the change between these two MRIs 
is the fact that we have abnormality in the right hemithorax. Now there's a little pleural fluid here, but otherwise we see that the diaphragm is up and there is opacity consistent with atelectasis adjacent to it. And that's a new finding between those two exams. And then I'll put this one up again. So here now we have the chest radiograph and the MRI the day before. So it's a new elevation of the TAMI diaphragm, but it's new from the uh, 21st. And I will tell you that it took a little bit of digging, but there was an event that happened on the 22nd of November, which was an ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. So this elevation of the diaphragm happened just after that and the approximate event was the ablation procedure. So this is phrenic nerve injury and right hemidiaphragmatic paralysis from the atrial ablation procedure. And let's see if I have the, yeah, you can see just a little excerpt of what they did. And it turns out that this is described, so let's have a look, it's obviously pretty uncommon but it happens less than 1%, but it has been described. So let's have a look. <clears throat> In this particular cohort, about 0.5%. So the idea, of course, is that there is sufficient energy deposited, and sometimes they get close to a superior pulmonary vein, and the phrenic nerve is nearby. So this is a case, I think it might be the second one I've seen this. Have we ever presented one before? at this webinar of this phenomenon? I showed one and then Travis showed one too. Both after ablation, I'm trying to remember because it's, it seems right. to be. Okay, so we have a couple between us, don't we? Oh, maybe it's, yeah, it's still an uncommon thing, of course. So that's what that case is about. All right. This is a young person that came here the other day from an outside hospital, very ill. And let me show you a couple of findings. So the time difference between these two is two days. And I'm going to withhold some history, but I want to show you that at this time, she certainly has a lot of diffuse lung disease. So she's got lung edema. I can tell just based on what I see here whether the lung edema is potentially iatrogenic or overhydration lung edema or sepsis-related lung edema, but that's in the background. What she has here are focal opacities in the lungs, and then keep an eye on one over here where you'll see over time that within this one, an area of cavitation develops, and there is another rounded opacity among others in the lung and this one here in which cavitation develops. So she's got findings are consistent with septic embolism. And indeed, this is a case of Lemier's type syndrome. So let me put up the CT of the neck for you, and then I'll put up the history as well. So, sorry, let me get the uh, neck over here. She has that history. And then she has the infection. What she doesn't have is jugular vein thrombosis, at least not internal jugular vein thrombosis. So here we'll see findings consistent with a soft tissue infection here. As I scroll down, you'll see it becomes rather superficial and pretty extensive and even crosses the midline here near the thyroid. And one of my colleagues in, in neuro said that this in the external jugular vein could be a small thrombus. But certainly otherwise, findings very consistent with Lemier syndrome. And as you can see here, she had the classic Fusobacterium necroforum. So that was from positive blood culture on the 13th of January. So there you can see the history and just a pretty typical case, pretty unfortunate of, uh, of Lemier syndrome and septic embolism from that, or in the Lemier's type syndrome without the jugular vein, internal jugular vein thrombosis at least. Yeah, wild. Crazy, right, isn't it?
All right. Here's a kind of an instructive case. So let me give you a little bit of background. This is oncology follow-up. So the patient has a history of metastatic endometrial cancer. And these are our follow-up exams. I will tell you that at a previous time in the past, she had radiation therapy for a metastasis in the right lower lung, as you see there. What she developed over time was this, which is nodal metastatic disease to the subcoronal region. So let me show you the development of opacities over time here. So now we'll go this way, and then I'll show you that this opacity here develops. And let me unlink these. So this is a new finding there compared to before October. And then I'll show you that even more recently that the amount of opacity in that lung, did I get that right? Gets even more extensive. So now we have that, but it's off to the side. So there is a history of radiation therapy for subcoronal nodes, but the question is, you know, why is there so much opacity in the right upper lobe off midline from radiation therapy for subcoronal lymph nodes? So what I did was, once I got that history, I still had a question as to why we're seeing so much asymmetric opacity from radiation, which was described just like that. And this is something that I think sometimes can be useful. I almost wish that we got this more often, but I asked the radiation oncology resident to actually give me the isodose curves. So if you look at this and you look at that axial section, for example, you'll see that they did actually radiate more of the right parahyla lung and right upper lung. And what we see here corresponds to that asymmetric dose, which includes cumulatively more radiation to the right side compared to the left side, if you look at those curves. So once we had that and spoke to the radiation oncologist, we were pretty confident that this is radiation associated disease. And I think these really helped a lot. There wasn't any other reasonable explanation for this because she wasn't febrile, didn't have uh, any signs of infection. So just a nice, a nice example of how to correlate these isodose curves and with what we see here. Just a nice example of that. Okay, Jeff, those are my cases. Excellent, thank you. Jeff? Yes? I can, if you show my screen, I can show the uh, fibro folliculomas here of the skin. Okay, that would be wonderful. Briefly. So it's these, um, it's these small white lesions, I'm told, that are the fibro folliculomas, these little white dots, these little elevated things, not the red area. He's probably been scratching up there. And definitely they're they're here on the face too, uh, and nose and uh, cheek here. I think these white, these white bumps are the fibro folliculomas, like this, this, and this. So this is the same guy who had the abnormal abnormalities on his chest CT. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, I'll start with this best case. You guys will like this one. This one's fresh. Um, so let me start with the chest radiograph if I can find it. Um, this is a middle-aged guy with a bunch of psychiatric diagnoses who has a chronic lung disease the past few years. It's getting worse. You can see he presents more short of breath with the oxygen. And he sort of has this granular appearance to his lungs. There's a little bit of scarring in the upper lobe, but it's a pretty diffuse process. Um, not at all, uh, no pleural involvement. So this is an outside CT, but they did do some thin sections. Uh, so these are through the lungs. You can see he's got pretty large pectoralis muscles. And it has this sort of almost arcading appearance, very shaggy look to it, these bands of consolidation, some patchy ground glass, a little bit of distortion. And then what else is kind of cool I should point out is along some of these airways in the upper lobes, you almost get these little cystic spaces. And it's a diffuse process. And so this guy, uh, he, he carried at some point a history of HP. It doesn't sound, I don't know what, what that is, but in some, some drug use. But the thing he injected a lot was a mineral oil. He would inject intramuscular mineral oil 
apparently it's a way to make your muscles look bigger and such. And so um, this is the um, outside. <coughs> um, you should see it. Do you guys see the path report? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is the outside excerpt from the path report, and I'll kind of skip over it. You can see he uh, yeah, injects this mineral oil and animal steroids on a regular basis into both arms. Redness at the site. He's got some other psychiatrics orders. So they looked at the um, slides. They see a um, proliferating fibroblasts, mature fibrosis around the cysts, intraalveolar foamy macrophages with large cystic changes. So that would go with lipids. Giant cells go with foreign bodies. And they say they were most concerned about exogenous lipid pneumonia given the history of um, mineral oil injection. They've also seen it with free silicone, which we have seen some cases of in this, this um, seminar, webinar. Also, um, they saw a lot of sort of in situ thrombi recanalization and some myelointimal thickening on the, in the pulmonary arterials. So you can see that with foreign body uh, injection, although they didn't see foreign bodies. Um, and also, he could have PE or pulmonary hypertension related to this. But it looks like a good example of an exogenous lipoid pneumonia from intramuscular mineral oil injection. I couldn't figure out why he was doing that. And then apparently we looked into it a little bit. It's a way to bulk, make yourself look bulkier than you are. Huh. So how does it get from the muscle to the lung by... You know, I, I was wanted to say anything, but I guess, you know, muscles are pretty vascular. So I guess it would be pretty easy to um, hit a vessel or every, you know, if you're doing it all every day, you could hit a vessel or it absorbs into the, somehow absorbs in the bloodstream. I was going to say it probably entravasates because it, it looks almost like a, like fat emboli with the peripheral uh -huh. distribution appearance. It does. It does. And, and unfortunately, yeah, one of past lives, that would be really neat to see, but. Yeah, Howard, one of the cases of excipient lung that we had here in the teaching file at UCSF from years ago, I think I may have shown it, but it was a, a weightlifter who had been injecting crushed up steroids and other things into his muscle. So presumably it's the same mechanism that it just entravasated, somehow ended up in the venous system and then embolized. So he get back via the via veins or lymphatics, which drain into veins, and then we get it back there too. So muscle is uh, vascular and would have very good way of mobilizing this stuff. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So this is an interesting case uh, that has caused great confusion, but I mean, we've gotten all the expertise sort of <laughs> focused in on it. So this is a young woman. Um, she's 17 and presented with this mass that was outside called it a hyalur mass, but you see there's actually a hyalur overlay sign. I don't think we had a lateral. If we did, I don't have it. Um, but she then got a CT scan, and you can see this is not in, at a hyalur location, but rather this is associated with a rib. And um, it's a very interesting appearance. It's got this low attenuation soft tissue, either some enhancement or bone or calcium, and then this periosteal reaction associated with She didn't really have any symptoms associated with it. Um, you know, our initial concern we in, in consulting with our MSK colleagues is, this looked aggressive and, you know, think about a Ewing sarcoma or an osteosarcoma, maybe a telangiectetic type. Uh, but in the, she was con, uh, consulted by, uh, for thoracic surgery. And the question was, was there neuroforaminal involvement? We weren't quite sure. So we, they did an MRI of this and I'll pull up some sequences. I'm going to the right ones here. Um, that's too low. Yeah, here we go. So you can see this is on a, a T1 image here. You've got some sort of intermediate signal and uh, there should be a, a T2. Here's the T2, oops, missed it there. Here we go. On T2, you can see it's quite T2 intense and there's a lot of flow voids running in it. Um, and then on top of that, they did some contrast enhancement and uh, there we go, let's try this one. the right one here. Yeah, the wrong one. Sorry guys, oh, let me try this one. I'll show it on the sagittal pretty well. There you go. So quite a bit of enhancement in this thing. And so the the um, neuroradiologist who interpreted the spine MR thought this was most consistent with as they reported as a venous malformation. It was contained. It had these large flow voids. They connected up to the hemiazgus system. It had uh, high T2 signal. So 
um, you know, these vascular malformations have all different names. So we showed it to, uh, subsequently it was shown to our interventional radiologist who's an expert in vascular malformations. Here's a, just another sequence showing that really strong T2 intensity. It said this looks like what they call an intraosseous hemangioma. And here is um, one of our residents pulled this case report. And you can see, looks exactly like our patient here. You've got that sort of, those little land, uh, land lines running out of the bone, the expanded bone the uh, intermediate T1 signal, the high TT signal, the intense enhancement, and then the little flow voids running through it. So there's a question about what you call these things. Um, uh, so, and then they did do a biopsy that, uh, there were two different biopsies done and one was not very diagnostic, but the second one showed what looked like dilated venous channels and other features of suggesting a vascular malformation. So uh, this is an expansile hemangioma of the rib. Uh, I think they're going to leave it alone at this point because she's asymptomatic and you've got imaging and a biopsy that do not show features of malignancy. Wow. Have you guys ever seen these? I, I think. No. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, this was a 20 year old in this case report. So it seems to be a lesion of young people. I don't know much about them. And you can see they're, they're pretty uncommon, but there's always this question about the, you know, hemangioma versus vascular malformation. Yes, Travis. I had showed, showed I showed a case of an uh, of a hemangioma of the vertebral body that looked like a metastasis, mm -hmm. and I can't remember if it was Brent. Was that an Emory case? I can't remember. It's been a couple uh, of years. Yes, it was. It looked very aggressive, you know, um, but it was a hemangioma. Yeah, spine. Yeah. All right. Have I shown you guys the flipped ICD generator? I couldn't remember. No, I don't think so. All right, well, this will be a quick and fun one. Put these all three up here. So um, these are three consecutive radiographs. This is a young woman who has an ICD placed. And this is the um, first radiograph. And you can see the orientation. I think I have them in the right order. Hold on. Uh, what's the button that shows the dates, Howard? Control. Control. There we go. So um, let's see, I have them going so left to right. So here's the initial one. And you can see the orientation of the, the, the generator. You see the headers coming off this way. The leads are all intact. This was uh, the one done, um, you can see about two months after placement and there had been a rotation of the generator and you can see a little coiling of the wire. But rather than rotating sort of in a clock orientation, this rotated along the vertical craniocaudid axis. So it must've been a capacious pocket. Um, and then on the su subsequent one, they had hoped it would flip back, but it, it actually flipped all the way around. So now it's a hundred, if I put these two, uh, oops, I'm sorry about that. Uh, two, there we go. Uh, I was trying to switch these two out. There we go. And uh, never mind. That the orientation is the opposite. The headers, uh, the, the leads are coming on the other side. The battery is oriented the other way, the straight edge is here. So it's almost a mirror image. So it flipped 180 degrees along the craniocaudid axis. Luckily, the leads did not dislodge. Um, so they're hoping that I think they went back and tried to tighten this pocket up a little bit to keep it in there. I've seen them flip along the transverse axis too. I had a lady who was gardening bent down and it flipped over. And of course, we've seen some twiddlers where they play with it and it rotates in a clockwise pattern. But this is just a different orientation. That particular lead may have come out a wee bit. Oh, uh, let's go back. Yeah, it may have pulled back a little bit. I think, oh, it, maybe. as far as I know, it was capturing it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, and then this quickly, this last one, just this is a, I thought this is a really interesting case, a nice example of this. So let's see, this is a patient with scleroderma and you can see has upper lung predominant fibrosis, a little bit more than we typically see and the hyla are retracted, the fissures displaced. And uh, that was in 2014. Here's a CT scan from 2009. And as soon as it all loads, I'll make a coronal for you. So we can see there is that. I'll make them a little prettier here. You can see there is that subpleural reticulation. So it was even milder back in 2009. And then here's the most recent CT scan. And as soon as I'll show the axial why it loads. But you can see there's a lot more 
thick in uh, consolidation, reticulation, traction, bronchiectasis, and epilobes, dilated esophagus associated with scleroderma. And so here we have on the coronal, a nice example of progression. So this looks like pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis, um, which we think about as an idiopathic thing or associated with GVHD or chronic lung rejection, allograft rejection. But this was a patient who just had scleroderma. And, you know, we usually think of NSIP, OP type patterns, but first time I've seen this and nice progressive appearance of it. They're not going to get a biopsy, but I think the imaging fits and the progression fits. Peculiar, but that's interesting. Yeah, I think, I think we've seen this all the time. We've, you know, we always chalked it up to that age related stuff, but I think we're recognizing it more and more even earlier on when it's just a little too much, it extends a little too centrally and you start noticing the features of upper lobe volume loss. All right. Oh, so gentlemen, before you hang up, can I, does anybody use um, Horos as an alternative to Osirix? No, no one. Not, I think okay. Howard has. No, David, David, I've experimented with it 